All right, welcome back to another Monday Live. I am your host, Pastor Joel Webin with Right Response Ministries. If you're new to our channel, um, we ask that you would go ahead and take a moment and subscribe. If you like the content that you've seen thus far, you can also click the bell uh, so that you'll be notified every time we come out with new pieces of content. Um, there's basically, you know, probably one, two, or even three videos a day. So we're coming out with content uh, daily, but if you want to watch our long form original content, right when it comes out, it's really simple. There's three main pieces of long form original content. That's the Sunday sermon uh, that I preach at my local church in Central Texas, Georgetown, Texas, about 45 minutes north of Austin. It's called Covenant Bible Church. If you're in the area or looking for a good church, check out our website, covenantbible.org, covenantbible.org. Uh, the sermon that I preach there each Lord's Day. On Sunday, usually the sermon hits YouTube and our podcast platform, Spotify, iTunes, around 5 or 6 p.m. that evening on Sunday. Um, so that's the first piece of content. The second is what we're doing right now. Every single Monday uh, at 2 p.m. Central Time, we do a live video where I address uh, certain uh, current events, uh, things that are cultural, political, theological, or sometimes I'll do a response video. That's what I'm going to be doing today, responding to Costi Hinn and Owen Strand and uh, a video that they recently put out, I believe it was two weeks ago at this point, in regards to patriarchy, and they also uh, briefly addressed uh, the topic of head covering. So that's what I'm going to be doing today, a response video. I'll be showing some clips uh, from the video that they did and then, uh, and then going ahead and discussing that from a, a distinctly biblical patriarchy view view and a biblical view of head coverings. And so Monday, it's uh, it's kind of a mixed bag. You don't know really what you're going to get, but if you want to check in, it's usually about an hour, sometimes all the way up to two hours. That's 2 p.m. Central Time every Monday live with Pastor Joel. So Sunday's the sermon, Monday is the live video, and then the last and third final uh, piece of long-form original content that you can be looking for is Tuesday. So it's Sunday, Monday, Tuesday. Tuesday is called Theology Applied. Same thing, 2 p.m. Central Time, and that's our flagship show where I uh, do an interview. And so it's a discussion, a conversation back and forth between me and a notable guest, uh, somebody who has uh, expertise in a particular area, usually a pastor or theologian, um, something that, that deals with the Christian biblical worldview as it is applied to our daily lives, political issues or cultural issues or marriage and parenting, family, all these kinds of things, economics, business, uh, the whole nine yards. So you can tune in on Sunday for the sermon. Monday for uh, live where I fly solo, live with Pastor Joel, and then Tuesday for Theology Applied where I interview a guest. All the other videos that you'll find on, on Wednesday and Thursday and Friday and Saturday are um, all just uh, compiled snippets. They're clips from those other three long form videos. All right, so we're going to go ahead and get into our response to Owen Strand and Costi Hinn, uh, an episode that they did on uh, Costi's platform that's called Together for the Gospel. Costi has put out a lot of great stuff, so I encourage you to uh, check out uh, Together for the Gospel. You can subscribe to his podcast or his YouTube channel. Uh, a lot of great material. I like Costi a lot, um, and I agree with probably 90 percent of what they said in this video, but there's a few key points uh, where I want to charitably push back. So that's what we're going to be doing today. But real quick, before we do, um, I wanted to mention, if you haven't checked it out already, Get Fight by Flight. Uh, this is a book that I just published a little over a month ago. Uh, the subtitle is Why Leaving Godless Places is Loving Godless Places. If you're on Twitter, uh, two weeks ago, there was a, within the Reformed Church camp, there was lots of controversy, and this was kind of uh, the spark that, that, uh, that started the fire. So if you're wondering, why is everybody arguing about whether you should live in California, whether you should live in Texas? Uh, well, it's because of uh, the book that I wrote and a particular interview where I was discussing the book with Steve Dace uh, from The Blaze. So I went on the Steve Dace show uh, with The Blaze Network, and we were talking about political strategy and uh, why... Um, why Christians and conservatives to a lesser degree, but especially Christians, Bible-believing Christians, should consider from a political standpoint leaving a blue state and moving to a red state as a way to love your neighbor. Um, if you look at the book, it's much more exhaustive than that. It's not just about political strategy. Um, ultimately, the lion's share of the book is just dealing with uh, very clear biblical commandments to men. Men as sons, uh, honoring their father and mother. Men as husbands with their wives. Men as fathers uh, with 
their children and uh, the obligations and duties that God gives us. And the men as grandfathers are leaving an inheritance to your children's children. So uh, if you read the book, you'll find out that it's probably one of the, the least controversial books that you'll be able to, to ever read. Uh, but it caused quite uh, the controversy on Twitter a couple weeks ago. So you can get that at Amazon or you can go to rightresponseministries.com. Uh, you can go to our website. I believe it's like $3 cheaper. So if you want to get a cheaper price, you can go to rightresponseministries.com, go to our store. You'll see it right there at the very front, uh, Fight by Flight. The forward's by Doug Wilson. Uh, the subtitle is Why Leaving Godless Places is Loving Godless Places. One more thing before we get into our video, I want us to uh, hear a quick, brief word from our first sponsor of the day. There are very few things as important as fellowship. Taking the time to spread the gospel is our duty as Christians, but sharing the word over a warm cup of Squirrely Joe's coffee, now that is our passion. Like the caffeine coursing through their veins, Squirrely Joe's is energized by their calling and emboldened to model their relentless faith. Based in Olney, Illinois, their association with the endangered white squirrel isn't just a novelty. It's a reminder that His Majesty can appear in the most unexpected places, in a humble squirrel, through a chance conversation, and even in a simple cup of joe. Share coffee, serve humbly, live faithfully. Squirrely Joe's is owned and operated by Joe Morris, his wife Rachel, and their seven children. They believe in being a truly Christian business where Christ is in the DNA of the business. Joe also believes in living quorum Deo, that means before the face of God, in every aspect of life. Joe is also a pastor of a small Reformed church, and both Joe and Rachel are veterans of the U.S. Marine Corps and U.S. Army, respectively. They believe that Christians should be building a thoroughly Christian economy by doing business with other like-minded Christians. The coffee is also fantastic. So, don't delay. Visit squirrelyjoes.com to order your coffee today. Again, that's squirrelyjoes.com to order your coffee today. Enter promo code RRM at checkout for 20% off your purchase. All right, so I'm going to play two clips uh, from this video with Owen Strand and Costi Hinn, and we're going to deal with um, actually the latter part of the video. So this first clip is going to be towards the end of their episode. We'll deal with that first in regards to uh, biblical patriarchy. What is that? Um, but then we'll deal with uh, head coverings, which was uh, the first portion of their episode together. And so I'll show a clip from the latter part of their video with biblical patriarchy, then a clip from the beginning of their video dealing with head coverings. So let's go ahead and play that first clip in regards to biblical patriarchy from the latter half of their episode together. There is a view now that I'm hearing in which, you know, women are not even supposed to or allowed to teach women theology they only would teach homemaking and while of course i advocate for that there for a second Nathan. certainly all right so we're going to pause it um so the view that costi is hearing um my first question would be brother where are you hearing that um i've never said that uh michael foster has never said that doug wilson has never said that brian sauvet has never said that eric Kahn, dan burkholder dale partridge anybody that i'm aware of uh, who holds to the view of biblical patriarchy, who has at least um, some shape or form, some degree of influence online. They have a podcast or they're a local pastor and have their sermons publicly available, something like that. I don't know anybody in the biblical patriarchy camp with any measure of influence, right? So I'm saying more than 37 followers on Twitter who would affirm what you just said. Not one. Uh, again, for the listener, what Costi just said is that there's a view, he's heard of a view that doesn't allow women to teach theology, uh, not even to other women. And uh, that's just categorically wrong. Um, and so let, let me go ahead and take a moment because this has been um, a misrepresentation that's been made not just by Costi in his defense. In fact, in Costi's defense, he may be making this mis misrepresentation because other um, in Christian conservative influencers uh, with, with large followings and a large platform 
uh, previously made the exact precise same misrepresentation and he may just be, Costi may just be taking their word for it um, because this has been said by um, a few people at this point, um, but it's simply not true. Uh, so the position, well, I'll articulate the position, but first I, I'm going to let Owen Strand articulate the position. And this is the beauty of this clip um, because I'm going to disagree and push back on some of the things that are said about head coverings. Uh, and that's the next clip that we'll play here in a moment. Uh, but what I love about Owen Strand's response is that he perfectly articulates the exact position that I and every other biblical patriarchy guy holds. To the D. No difference. Owen Strand doesn't want a woman, even in a non-mixed audience, right? So, so none of us, whether you're complementarian or whether you're, you're patriarchal, uh, in both instances, neither of us wants a woman teaching uh, in a mixed audience where men are present, right? Neither one of us want Beth Moore preaching on Mother's Day with men in the room. Um, but Owen goes further than that. He doesn't just say, hey, women shouldn't teach men, but they can teach theology with no disclaimer, no caveats, no specifications, just teach uh, uh, theology in a general sense in whatever capacity they wish to teach it, so long as the context is correct, meaning a non-mixed audience, only women being present. That's not what Owen Strand says. Um, so what Owen Strand is about to tell you is that, yeah, women can teach other women theology. But even with that being said, uh, there should be a particular emphasis of, of uh, what particular theology and maybe more specifically, what particular application this theology teaching should be, um, should, should be emphasizing. Uh, that it's not just um, a woman in a woman-only context, no men present in the room, teaching a 17-week-long course on theology proper, doctrine of God. Owen doesn't want that. He doesn't. And neither do I. And in that regard, we hold the very same position. So both of us say, yeah, uh, not only should a woman learn theology, a woman should be learning all kinds, whatever, whatever theology there is, she should be learning, that, because that's what 1 Timothy chapter 2 says in verse 9. It begins by saying a woman must learn. So uh, now it, it quickly gets into um, addressing how she should learn, with what posture of heart that she should learn uh, with humility, that she should learn um, uh, with, like, like 1 Peter chapter 3, with a quiet and gentle spirit. So she, she should learn in full submission, uh, and that she should remain silent. But the very first words that the apostle says um, is not regarding uh, a woman's posture of heart, namely submission in her learning, but the first thing that the apostle Paul says is that she must learn. So it's not only permissible, it's not merely allowed that a woman learns theology, but she actually is commanded, she must learn theology. And where would be the implicit question? Where does she learn theology? Well, she learns theology right next to her husband husband on the same pew, <laughs> sitting right next to him in the same Lord's Day gathering of the saints as the male, biblically male qualified elders are preaching through whole books of the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, teaching the whole counsel of God, all theology. So women should learn all theology and women are permitted and even commanded older women, women which would mean more spiritually mature women, are not only uh, commanded to learn all theology, but then to teach theology to other women, but, but not 17-week-long courses of doctrine of God. Why? Because women shouldn't know that. No, of course they should know that, but, but they should learn 17-week courses on doctrine of God right alongside their husband on the same pew on the Lord's Day from the male elders. That's the context. So the male elders are teaching theology in the broad sense, doctrine of God, those kinds of things. I'm just using that as just one example. But then women are teaching other women theology. But the reason why you, you're, you're, um, you're enlisting a woman instead of just using the male elders is because in this context of, of Titus chapter 2, older women training younger women, they're not just teaching theology in general or theology in the abstract, but they're teaching theology particularly as it pertains to those feminine domestic virtues that women are particularly called to, like submission to husbands or loving children or, or, or uh, not slandering or being given to much wine 
wine or doing this or doing that. The very things that Titus 2 lists. And that is precisely what you're about to hear Owen Strand uh, communicate. He's going to convey the very same argument that I and Michael Foster and Brian Sauvé and Eric Kahn and all these different guys have also conveyed. This is our position. It has been misrepresented, but it is our position. And so you really don't need to hear more from me. Uh, if you'd like to be persuaded of biblical patriarchy, um, Owen Strand does a fine job. Let's hear is there a place biblically for godly women? And I'm going to name one. I'm thinking of Susan Heck, who, you know, if Justin Peters thought she was off the rails, he would not go to her church. Susan Heck is beloved in the Bible church world. She's not a Beth Moore. She's not out on the circuit with Priscilla Shire. This is a dear sister that many of our churches have speak. Uh, I was just in dialogue with her. I'd love for her to come and bless some of our women and our sisters here at the church. Uh, this isn't Christine Kane or Beth Moore preaching on Mother's Day or anyone else for that matter. This is just women teaching theology in the right format and applying it to our sisters, contentment, all the like. Can you speak to that and the, the unique nuances we maybe need to be careful with while we hold a strong view? Yes, I can. Wow. What a, what a um, collection of uh, questions and matters there. Um, I would say we start from what is clear and we reason out to what is less clear. What is clear is that um, pastors and elders are those who are charged with theological and spiritual oversight of the congregation. So in that sense, um, uh, the women's ministry of the church in a form is the preaching and teaching ministry of the church. Um, we want to guard against, that is, uh, a form of women's ministry that is out there, very much out there, and that I and others have reacted to in past days where, yes, a woman has a pastor and elders, but um, she thinks of the women's ministry uh, coordinator, director, teacher, whatever it may be, and whatever staff are there as really understanding her and really mm. caring for her and really like that's getting... That's her real leaders. That's her real yeah. connection. Yeah, she's got a formal guy who's the pastor, but the one she really looks to uh, for, for spiritual vitality, whatever you want to say, Hmm. is her women's ministry teacher, whatever that term is. Let's pause it again for just a that. moment. I want to say... Yeah. So that's a fantastic point. Um, such a fantastic point that I myself have made it probably a dozen times over the past year. Um, and all the other guys who hold the biblical patriarchy have been making this exact same point as well. So I'm glad that Costi Hinn and Owen Strand agree with us um, because it is um, significant and it is dangerous uh, when this particular point that Owen is making is disregarded. Uh, there's a difference in having a women's only ministry context, whether it's once a month or it's a women's conference or whatever it might be, where a particular woman who has been uh, deemed by the elders of the local church as being spiritually mature, she is spiritually older in the faith, um, is granted the opportunity, not in a mixed crowd, but with women only to teach theology Right? Because you can't teach about submission to husbands apart from theology. You can't teach about loving children apart from... The, it is teaching theology. Of course it's teaching theology. For instance, let, let me give you an example. My wife, um, probably one of the most consistent theological pieces of counsel that she regularly gives uh, women in our local church setting is uh, about the sovereignty of God, the doctrine of the sovereignty of God. Um, but it's always in relation. This is why it always comes up. It always comes up because um, it's always in relation to a woman who is struggling to submit to her husband. Now, 1 Peter chapter 3 uh, talks about how Sarah even called her husband Abraham her Lord, lowercase l, Lord, like saying, Sir. It was uh, um, not, not idolatry, not saying, you know, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, not Yahweh, not the Lord, um, not Lord of Lords, but lowercase l, Lord. It, it was like referring, it would be like a woman in modern day referring to her husband as a sir. Uh, it, was a, it was a sign of respect. And so um, the Apostle Peter, inspired by the Spirit, lists this as an example. And then he goes further and says, and you do well, you are her daughters, her spiritual daughters. You're, you're a chip off the old block. You're following in this godly example that Sarah modeled. Um, if you do likewise, and, and if you do not fear anything that is frightening. 
Well, that seems random, right? It almost seems like Peter's just just randomly changing the subject, right? It's like Sarah respected her husband, and you are godly like Sarah, the, the women of old, if you also respect your husband. And you feel like there just needs to be a period there. But then the Apostle Peter immediately in the same breath continues and says, and you are her daughter if you do likewise, you follow her example, and do not fear anything that is frightening. Well, why are you changing the subject? Well, the answer is he's not. He's not changing the subject. Um, the thing that is frightening in reference in that particular text is submitting to a husband, especially because a human husband is not Jesus. He's not infallible. He's not sinless. And so human husbands, now in the context of 1 Peter 3, it's, it's also talking about uh, winning over an unbelieving husband, that you might be yoked, unequally yoked, right? You got saved, you were converted after already having, having been married to a man. Both of you are unbelievers. The Lord in his sovereign grace chose to save the wife, but for whatever reason has not chosen to save the husband, at least not yet. So now you have this Christian woman who is married, not just a sinful husband, but a sinful unbeliever leaving husband. And what Peter is saying is he's saying, yeah, that's frightening, right? That to win him over without a word, not being argumentative, not being domineering, not trying to usurp his authority, but with your kindness and gentleness, with a quiet spirit, trying to, to display godliness and submission to even this unbelieving sinful husband in such a way that he might see your good works and that he might come to faith in Jesus, that he might be won over. That is a frightening and daunting task because this man who is a sinful man, in this particular case, an unbelieving sinful man, he might abuse his authority. You're being called to submit, not just in this case to Jesus, but to a sinful man who is not Jesus, who may take advantage of your submission and who may abuse his authority. That's frightening. Well, what's one of the things, what's one of the theologies, right? Women teaching theology, a theology, a doctrine that would make this less frightening. Well, one thing that would make it less frightening is if standing beyond and above this sinful, unbelieving husband who is not infallible, what if behind him there was an infallible God who is sinless, who is perfect, and who's not just omnipowerful, right, omnipotent, but, but he is omnibenevolent, all-loving, and that he is he has promised you in his word in Romans chapter 8 that, that all things work to get together for not just the glory of God, but for the good of those who, who love him and have been called according to his purpose. And so you're this Christian wife that, that God saved and God promises in his word that you love him because he first loved you. That's 1 John 4, 19. And so because you now love him because you've been born again by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone, and have been called according to his salvific purposes that he is committed, not just with some things, but with all things, including your marriage, being married to an unbelieving man, to work that, not just that in such a way that he would get eternal glory, but for your good. Not just his glory, but for your good. So, so what's one of the things that makes submission to a sinful man less fearful? That you don't have to fear that which is frightening? Uh, because even though this guy may be a sinner, and maybe he's even an unregenerate pagan sinner, Standing above and beyond him is the sovereign God who is working, not just salvaging. Something bad happens, you know, life gives you lemons, right? Not God. He's not in charge. Life, this, this abstract force, like in Star Wars, the universe gives you lemons, but God will try to make lemonade. Uh, no, no, no. Um, if life gives you lemons, it's because God himself ordained to give you lemons, for the purpose of making lemonade, because lemonade is delicious, and God has your good in mind. So standing above and beyond your husband is a sovereign God who is omnibenevolent. He's all good. He's committed to your good. He's all loving, and he is omnipotent. He is sovereign, right? This, that's the doctrine, the theology, the sovereignty of God, meaning that behind your husband, he's making certain decisions on the ground day to day that affect you, and some of those things may be really hard. But beyond it, God is orchestrating all those things, not just salvaging, but orchestrating and ordaining because God is sovereign over everything. This is R.C. Sproul, classic R.C. Sproul, not one maverick molecule in all the universe. Likewise, if there's not one uh, maverick molecule, there's not one maverick um, uh, husband. 
And so when my wife is counseling other women in the church who are struggling to submit to their husband, often she does so by teaching them and encouraging and reminding them about the doctrine of the sovereignty of God, because submission to sinful human husbands is frightening, but they are commanded, wives, not to fear anything that is frightening. And one of the things that makes this frightening task less frightening is believing that God is sovereign over your husband and he won't let that husband do a single thing that wouldn't ultimately be not only for God's glory, but also for that wife's good. So that's a woman teaching theology, but it's not an abstract general theology proper doctrine of God 17 week course. It's right in line with Titus 2. So a woman must learn all theology. And I would argue a woman also must teach all theology, but for the purpose and with a particular application of feminine virtues, which are listed in Titus chapter two. That's my position. That's everyone who holds biblical patriarchy, who has more than 40 followers on Twitter's position. And God bless, it is Costi and Owen's position. So let's let Owen go ahead and finish now. To a man and a woman alike, uh, elders and pastors are the ones who are provided by God for your spiritual oversight and feeding and edification and shepherding. Okay, um, I do want to recognize uh, with wind in my sails that in Titus two, uh, women are called to teach other women, older women uh, to younger women, uh, or to put it slightly differently, more mature women to less mm-hmm. mature women, and that that teaching does center in the home, marriage family, homemaking, these sorts of disciplines. It's very clear um, in, in the text in Titus 2, 3 to 5. There is that phrase that you said, teach what is good. And I think that's where we get um, the, uh, the the charge from God for older women like a Susan Heck or like my mother-in-law, Jody Weir, to go yeah. to different churches, let's say, and, and teach about contentment or godliness or prayer or something like this. Um, so I think we have warrant for women doing that. They're always going to do that in a careful way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and there is, we're, we are, by the way, Costi, in some gray area here. Um, probably there, there's going to be some room for disagreement among strong complementarians, among complementarians more broadly. So let that be said. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I, would, I would want to affirm everything I just said about teaching what is good. I also want to be um, a little more defined than some are. I'd be a little closer to some Presbyterians, for example, who would invest uh, again, that theological teaching and oversight in the elder office. Um, but I do think we have leeway for, for a woman to teach on those topics that we were mentioning, uh, the sovereignty of God and how it applies to the seasons of a woman's life or something like mm. this. I, yes. I, I'm good with that. I, I think, though, a godly woman, a mature woman who is teaching is going to do so in a way that is not trying to present herself as a theologian in the way that a, uh, a man at a TMS or a GBTS or whatever it's going to be is, is presenting himself and, and an elder of the local church is seeing himself as. Um, so there's a lot more I could say there. Um, I would not be one who would be pushing women to write um, commentaries or works of formal theology or that sort of thing. Again, some gray area. We have some freedom here. But I do think a godly woman is going to teach what is good. She is also, however, going to say the mandate to teach doctrine in the clearest sense in Scripture is not given to me. The mandate to teach doctrine is given to the elders. I'm going to do that in my home, with my kids, in discipleship, and even, yes, in, a, in maybe a women's ministry setting. But, but even as she does so, Uh, If she does so, she's making clear um, the one appointed to shepherd the church through theological teaching and spiritual oversight is the elder. There you have it. So Owen doesn't want, I don't know if you caught that, he doesn't want women to write uh, full-length commentaries on whole books of the Bible, which I would just respond by saying, you bigot, how dare you, you patriarchal man. Welcome to the team, Owen. We're glad to have you. Um, yeah, that's that's the position. I would, <laughs> I'm being facetious, uh, but here I am speaking plainly now. I would wholeheartedly agree with Owen in that assessment. There's a difference in a woman teaching, even with only women being present, so she's not exercising authority or teaching a man, 
But even in a context that is women only, there's a difference in a woman teaching theology with the, the express purpose and application towards that which is feminine. The life of a woman, stages of life, the sovereignty of God as it applies to this, waiting for marriage, as you long to be marriage, but you, uh, married, but you find yourself still single, these kinds of things. Um, there's a difference in a woman teaching all theology, but particularly applied to a woman's life which is what Titus 2 talks about, versus a woman in a general, overarching manner writing commentary on the book of Romans. And what Owen's saying is it's not even that that belongs to men and not women. Um, it's primarily that that belongs to pastors. And pastors, biblically speaking, are called to be men. So, so the, the individuals who are tasked with teaching the whole counsel of God in a general sense to both men and women that applies for all different kinds of people, uh, going verse by verse through whole books of the Bible, writing commentary or preaching ex expository series through the book of Romans, um, that is a distinctly male role. And it's been given to the elders who are biblically qualified males. Um, what, what Owen has just articulated is wonderful. Um, I think for me, the difficulty is seeing the contradiction. And, and I can't help but think at least at some level uh, that perhaps the disconnect is not what's being taught, but a disagreement over who's allowed to teach it. Because both Owen and I would hold to patriarchy, at least on this point. That is the patriarchal position. And again, like I said, I can't do anything about it. There's always going to be crazy people, right? So this isn't just, oh, well, patriarchy attracts some crazy people. It does. That's true. That's true. Um, but almost every theological position, there will always be some people following that person who is articulating something that is true and biblical, but then certain people in the camp that are on the fringes or well over the line and just downright extreme. So again, that's why I say I'm sure there are people within the patriarchal. I, I've heard random people on Twitter trying to bring back polygamy, but I'm not a fan. And, and, and the guys that, that, that I know are not fans. Um, so that may be, again, somebody with, you know, 30 followers on Twitter, but that's, that's not uh, somebody who is leading in that particular position. And so all that being said, on this point, I think that uh, Costi and Owen would agree with someone like me and Eric Kahn, for instance. Um, the difference, though, I think, is not that, uh, that, that the patriarchy guys are teaching one thing, and it's extreme, and it's dangerous. And Owen and Costi are teaching another thing, and it's careful and nuanced and winsome. I don't think that's the issue. I don't think it's what's being taught, and there being this drastic distinction between uh, what is being taught. I think it's kind of at some level just a disagreement over who's allowed to teach it. Costi and Owen are allowed to teach it. I'm not. I, I think at some level, and, I, and, I, and I'm hoping that my brothers listen to this, and I'd love to have them on my show to have a conversation, but that's, I could be wrong, and I don't want to impute motives, but that's what it feels like. And, and, and here I am talking about feelings. Feelings, you know, we don't follow our heart. We follow Christ. So I could be wrong. Hear me. I could be wrong. But it, it doesn't feel like a, a serious concern from my brothers in regards to the actual substance and content that these guys within the biblical patriarchy camp are teaching substance that is extreme and dangerous. If Because we have the same substance. And, and you can say, well, it's tone. I don't think that's it either. It might be. I, I don't think it is. I think the big difference is not the substance. It's, it's not uh, the, the tone or the methodology of communicating that substance. I think the big difference between us is, um, I think Owen just doesn't think that I should be teaching these things. I think he just, he would rather do it. Um, I don't know. It, it feels a little bit like gatekeeping, to be completely honest. It feels a little bit like it. All right, we're, we're going to go ahead and get into the head covering piece. But before we do, uh, one more brief word from our last sponsor of the day.
With the banking industry in another tailspin and the Fed ready to raise interest rates once again, many of you are probably asking, when does this madness stop? If you're interested in learning how to establish a family banking system outside of today's mainstream banking insanity, then schedule a call with our sponsors at Private Family Banking. There's a way for individuals, families, and businesses to put their hard-earned money to work continuously accruing compounding interest and then have those resources available as collateral for cash or for financing investments, businesses, college, and other major life expenditures without having to go to the big banks for loans. Income tax protected, safety from stock market losses, guaranteed rates of compounding interest, and the ability to store up an inheritance for your children's children and avoid the death tax on your estate. If this interests you, then email our friends at banking at privatefamilybanking.com. Again, that's banking at privatefamilybanking.com. Schedule your appointment today. All right, so we're going to go ahead and uh, look at our last clip from Costi Hinn and Owen Strand. This is on Costi's platform. It's called Together for the Gospel, um, or I think it's just called For the Gospel. Is that? Yeah, Nathan just confirmed. It's just For the Gospel. Uh, check him out. He's on Spotify, iTunes, YouTube, and a lot of his content is fantastic. Uh, Costi and Owen are uh, solid brothers in the Lord with good doctrine. Uh, these are guys that you should be listening to. They are. Um, I don't know if they would say the same, um, but that's my position, that these are guys that you should be listening to, especially, uh, you should especially be listening to them because as we've just discovered in the first half of our show, um, Owen's position is the very same as mine. So of course I want you to listen to him because, uh, because he's teaching you the same thing that I've been talking about. So uh, real quick, before we go into this last clip dealing with head coverings, I wanted to share a tweet that I wrote a few weeks ago. It's a, it's a thread, uh, but it's not very long. Uh, where I was just, this is before Costi and Owen's episode dropped, the one that we're discussing today. Uh, but this is where I just tried to clear up some of the misconception that seems to come from brothers like Costi and Owen uh, that would say, oh, these, these, uh, these, you know, trad wives and Theo bros, right? So, which doesn't feel super charitable, you know, but, um, you know, there are some, uh, again, solid brothers and sisters for that matter within the complementarian reformed camp, um, that don't, they don't like the patriarchal guys and, uh, they won't even call us, you know, the, the patriarchy camp. Um, instead, uh, we usually, you know, get the label of, you know, trad wives and Theo bros, um, something like that. And so there was some of that going on, um, I saw on online. And so I wanted to try to, uh, to clarify, uh, my position, which is again, um, as far as I understand it, the same position that, uh, that other guys in the camp hold themselves. And, uh, and so I wrote this. And I think that, I guess my question would be if Owen ends up listening to this, I, again, I'd love to have him on the show, but if Owen listens to this, I would love to just to know from Owen directly, uh, what, what is it uh, from what he just articulated with Costi and what you're about to hear from what I wrote in this tweet, what are, what are the, the difference? Cause I feel like kind of that meme with Pam from the office where she's, you know, they're holding two pictures. Uh, corporate wants you to, uh, to determine the difference between the two pictures. And she says, it's the same picture. I feel like it's exactly the same. What Owen just articulated about Titus two and how he does want women learning theology for sure. And teaching theology, qualified women teaching theology to other women, but he doesn't uh, want a Jen Wilkins situation where, where she becomes the pseudo uh, the pseudo de facto pastor of the women to where, yes, there are male elders at the church that actually wear the label pastor, but this women's minister is actually seen as the women's pastor, even though that term's not used. And she's not just teaching doctrine as it particularly applies to that, which is feminine to wives and to mothers and single women. But instead, um, she's just teaching theology in an abstract general sense, like doctrine of God, multiple week courses. Um, that really should be done 
on the Lord's day by the elders, the male elders of the church. And that's where you get into weird things like Jen Wilkin saying that, you know, that women can better identify with penal substitutionary atonement and, you know, and the, the, the uh, salvific work of Christ because of their menstrual cycle. And I'm not trying to be crude here, but that's what she said, because women bleed once a month. They can better understand the bleeding Savior and his penal substitutionary atonement. That's weird. That's weird. And so I agree with Owen. I know Owen would have a problem with that. Um, I agree with him that that's, we don't want that. We, and so instead, we want women, if they are going to teach, which is good and right, Titus 2 talks about, they're teaching for a particular purpose, um, very specific application to the feminine, the feminine life. Uh, to submission to husbands and loving children, and these kinds of things. And then theology, just in a general sense, should be taught to the whole body of the church, men and women alike, together, primarily on the Lord's Day. And the primary teachers of theology in that general sense is the male eldership of the church. I know we agree. So that's what Owen just articulated. That's my position. Here's a tweet that I wrote before they came out with this episode that I think articulates the very same thing. But I just want to be abundantly clear. So here's the tweet. Let's go ahead and do it. Uh, there appears to be a misunderstanding of biblical patriarchy. I'm giving the benefit of the doubt that it's not simply blatant slander. Allow me to offer a simple explanation in an attempt to clear things up. Biblical patriarchy insists that women should uh, learn every bit of doctrine. Women should, um, it's hard, I'm sorry, it's hard, it's small, uh, but women should sit right alongside their husbands on the Lord's Day, there we go, uh, learning the meaning and application of every verse in the Bible. A woman must learn. That's 1 Timothy chapter 2, I believe it's verse 9. Biblical patriarchy also insists that older women should, that is, they must, train, that would be teach younger women. And there is uh, no way to do this apart from teaching these women theology. However, there is a dynamic difference between an older woman teaching younger women the feminine virtues of Titus 2 while utilizing the doctrine of the whole of Scripture and an older women, woman teaching younger women a 12-week course on doctrine of God. The former example is most certainly women teaching women theology, but with the express purpose of helping these uh, younger women to better understand how to live out biblical womanhood. The latter example, the 12-week you know, course on doctrine of God in the general sense, uh, that would be an example. The latter example is creating women-only context for a woman to function as a pseudo-pastor while still being a card-carrying complementarian, rather than simply allowing women to learn subjects such as doctrine of God from their male pastors right alongside their husbands. My constituents and I have only um, opposed the latter, not the former. Let's, let's go scroll a little bit more. So when someone makes the blatant assertion that biblical patriarchy refuses to allow women to teach other women theology at all, because that's what's been said, right? And I got to be clear about that, because words matter, and, and, and slander is a big deal. It's a big sin, and, and I'm not saying in this case, just to be clear, I'm not saying that Costi or Owen have slandered uh, me or other guys holding to biblical patriarchy, but there are some in the complementarian, conservative, reformed, evangelical camp who have. It has been said, it has been said um, that the Theo bros and trad wives, and my name has been thrown in there along with a bunch of others, that we assert that women should not teach theology, period. And that has never been said. Again, not by anyone with more than, than 35, 40 Twitter followers. <laughs> that has not been said. Uh, we have never said that a, a women cannot, per Titus 2, teach other women theology. What we're saying is that they should not necessarily be writing in a general sense, doctrine of God type theology, whole commentaries on whole books of the Bible, those kinds of things, teaching in that sense, 12-week series on, on theology proper, that that ultimately belongs to the elders who are male. But women do teach theology. 
It is theology, and it comes from the whole Bible. It's the whole counsel of God, but through the avenue of the express purpose and application, practical and emotional application for the life of a woman. I even heard someone misrepresent us so far on, on, on their podcast that they said that the patriarchal position, and they were referring to me, and I know this, and I'm not going to name them because I want to be careful, but they were referring to me, they were referring to Eric Kahn, they were refer- referring to a few others. They said uh, that, that we, that our position, that we had articulated that women should not, not only should they not teach theology, which that's a misrepresentation as I've already demonstrated, but that they, they said that, we, uh, that our position is that women shouldn't even learn theology. Uh, that's a level of slander. Uh, that, that is just, again, if it's unintentional slander, if it's just a massive misunderstanding, well, it was publicly said, it needs to be publicly corrected. But, but that is so far from what anyone in my camp is communicating um, that it's, it's just, uh, it's deception, it's deceitful, it's sinful. It's really, it's sinful. And, uh, and, and it needs to be publicly repented of. It needs to be publicly repented of. And, and I think that's what I see. You know, I, I think that, that there's guys in the conservative, reformed camp. Complementarian Owen, as he said, would describe himself as a hard complementarian. I appreciate that. I've often heard um, the language of broad complementarianism, that, uh, that, that the distinction of roles between men and women, that, it's, uh, that it centers in the home of the church, but that there is a broader application of a distinctly male leadership even outside of the home of the church in society as a whole. And I think that Owen affirms that. I think he even said that in this episode with Costi Hinn. So that's a broad complementarian that I would say is, is pretty much, just, that's, that is the, the patriarchal position, um, right? Going back to the, the meme of, from the office, Pam from the office, right? Corporate wants to tell you to tell them the difference between these two pictures, broad complementarianism and biblical patriarchy. It's the same picture. Um, for the most part, at least 98% of that is pretty much the same picture. Um, but I think there's people in, in this camp that, um, that for a long time, and, and this is, you know, I want to be clear with my words. This is speculation. So I'm going to call it what it is. It's speculation. It could be true. It also cannot be true. Um, but I think there's some people who have been in the conservative, evangelical, reformed, complementarian camp for a while. And they're used to being kind of like the, like if you think of bookends, bookends of orthodoxy, what, what theological positions are permissible, acceptable, the status quo. There's a group that, that have, have become accustomed to being um, the bookend in terms of on the right, right? The, 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 uh, you, you know, like Gandalf, you shall not pass. I am the most biblically conservative that you are allowed to be in the, the realm of orthodoxy within the, the orthodox reformed you know, evangelical camp. And I, and I think that, that part of the problem, again, is not the content, the substance, the actual position. I think there's just, at some level, there's a frustration. It seems like a frustration that, uh, no, 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 we are the designated bookend for uh, the, the right side of evangelical Reformed Christians. That you can go this far to the left, and you can go this far to the right, and, and we set the boundary, the marker, for how far you can go to the right. And now you got a couple guys, you got a handful of guys that are kind of emerging in the providence of God, who are not that extreme, they're not that far right, but they're, but they're articulating some different positions that would be a little bit more to the right of someone like Owen Strand, and, um, and it seems to be unwelcome. And I don't know if it's because these positions are uh, truly just dangerous and poisonous, or if it's just because, is it the position, what's being said, or is it just who? No, 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 you. I could have said that. In fact, I think I will say that a couple of weeks from now on a podcast with Costi. I'll say the very same thing that you said, um, but you can't say that. 
I don't want you saying it. That, that, that is the way it, it appears. A little bit. A little bit. All right, let's go ahead and uh, let's check out this last clip. But man, it's, I mean, it's crazy when you get the misrepresentation of um, the patriarchy guys, the Theo bros are saying that, uh, that women aren't allowed to teach theology. How do you teach submission to husbands without teaching theology? And in that, it includes big theology like the sovereignty of God, the example that I just gave earlier. And, and to hear the misrepresentation that is not, still hasn't been corrected. It's been over a month. Um, but public misrepresentation that, that uh, the, the Theo bros and trad wives, the patriarchy guys, um, that they believe that uh, women can't even learn theology. Um, I mean, again, that, and that wasn't Owen, that, that wasn't uh, Costi, but there was one very influential individual who, who said explicitly that and has not corrected it. And uh, that's just, I mean, that's just a level of slander. I, I, it's hard to, uh, it's hard to articulate. It is uh, so deceptive. It, it's hard to put it into words. Um, it could have been unintentionally slander, ignorance, out of ignorance. Uh, but either way, man, Unless that person, that individual is still ignorant and has no clue that they did it. Um, if they have, if they've come to realize, oh, whoops, I misrepresented them. Then, uh, man, do not delay uh, in, in making that right. Leave your gift at the altar and go and go and make that right. I lied about my brother. I slandered my brother and I did it publicly to thousands and thousands of people. Right. That's what Nathaniel Jolly did. Right? God bless him for it. Nathaniel Jolly, he misrepresented me a couple weeks ago with, with my book, Fight by Flight. He took um, a clip from my sermon and he took it out of context. And, um, you know, 90 seconds before he started the clip, I, I was specifically talking about Christian men in a state like California, in a blue progressive state who are struggling to provide, physically provide for their families and in this hypothetical scenario, have the opportunity to move out of that state to a place where they would be able to better provide but are choosing not to, refusing. And then I said that a man like that um, is being stupid and you can't compare it to, to faithful Christians in North Korea because the faithful Christians in North Korea who are struggling to provide, they, the, the difference is that they're trapped. They can't get out. But for you, you're not trapped. You're just being stupid. Now, I wasn't saying all Christians in California are stupid, but, but the context of a man deliberately who's not providing for his family could, in the example that I was giving, hypothetically could provide for his family if he made a geographic move, but is deliberately choosing not to. That's the person that I was calling stupid. And in that light, just to be fair, the Apostle Paul literally says that if a man uh, does not provide for the members of his household, he's worse than an unbeliever. He's denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. So when I say stupid, I'm kind of being winsome and, and soft compared to the, the verbiage of the Apostle Paul. But, but you cut that context out and then boom, you put that clip out there and boom, I, I just, you know, misrepresented to thousands of people and, and a ton of people were jumping on me. I can't believe he said this. Look at him. He's so extreme. I knew it. The Christian nationalists, you know, um, <laughs> you know, because they couldn't get me in the battle two months prior with Christian nationalism and couldn't find the fatal flaw, you know, and, you know, it's like, he's a racist. And then we come out with a statement on, you know, the gospel and Christian nationalism where we explicitly, you know, uh, denounce racism and, eth you know, sinful ethnic partiality. And, uh, well, we couldn't get him there, but we know he's bad. Uh, it's not if he's wrong. We know he's wrong and we just haven't found it yet. And now he came out with his book and he's calling all Christians in California stupid. Well, my whole point in bringing it up is Nathaniel Jolly, when that was uh, brought to his attention, God bless him. I appreciate this. Um, he corrected it. He deleted the tweet and he publicly made it right. He publicly uh, uh, slandered me. And I'll give him the benefit of the doubt that he did ignorantly, that he didn't know. So then he publicly uh, clarified and said, you know what? I still don't agree with his overall position. I still think he's wrong, which he's that's perfectly permissible. Of course he can think I'm wrong. Uh, maybe I am wrong, you know, but, but I misrepresented him. That's not what he said. Here's the context. I'm sorry. To which I retweeted him immediately and said, um, hey, you caused me a lot of grief over the last 24 hours. And what am I going to do? immediately forgive you because Christ has forgiven me far more. And it was done. But the individual who said that uh, the patriarchy, the Theo bros, uh, don't believe that women should even learn 
much less teach theology, uh, they've never made it right. And I've got a sneaking suspicion that they're not ignorant, that they know. Um, so we'll see. All right, last clip. This is from Owen and Costi. Now we're going to go to the beginning of their video dealing with head coverings. The first question I have for you is on 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16, head coverings and all of that. It's a hot topic these days, lots of confusion, but also what I'm hearing from people, lots of willingness to listen and learn. I spoke with one brother recently who humbly just said to me, hey, I come to this issue with no bias. I just want to be right with the Lord. I want to be in line with God's word. Is this an issue of public command or private conviction? Big topic. It's all over the place. So could you walk us through first and foremost on the issue of womanhood, head coverings, order, all of that? How would we apply this issue? Some people mandate head coverings. Others don't help us think through this biblically. Yeah, a really tough issue, frankly, uh, Costi, one of the toughest in terms of exegesis. This is the kind of passage that in a seminary classroom, in a Greek exegesis class, a professor will throw at his students and, uh, you know, you try to reason it out for some time because the passage, uh, 1 Corinthians 11, 2 to 16, takes some fascinating twists and turns. So let that be said from the outset. Uh, second thing to say is that at the end of this chapter, Paul tells the Corinthians that this is not something to be contentious about. So that's a very important framing word. Paul is giving pastoral guidance, and that matters. We're not playing that soft in terms of it not being the Word of God or something like that. But Paul is saying, hey, just FYI, I'm speaking into your situation, but I don't want you to freak out over this. I don't want you to divide over this. Honestly, I think if we're reading Paul and interpreting him, he's saying don't divide over this, really. What I think Paul is teaching in 1 Corinthians 11 on head coverings is basically that um, the Corinthian women are in a compromised culture, and Paul wants them to mark themselves out as women. He wants men to look distinct from women. That's to the glory of God. He wants women even to image that they are made from man in terms of Adam and Eve. And so the wife is, is submissive to her husband and distinct from him in a God-glorifying way. And so if you follow the passage all the way through, you and I could talk about this for two hours, three hours at length. But if you follow the passage all the way through, you see at the end that um, Paul uses uh, the term covering in the noun form in verses 14 and 15 to describe the woman's long hair. We're not talking about a woman who has cancer, tragically, or something like that and saying she's in sin because she can't grow her hair long. But what Paul is laying out for the Corinthians, and I think beyond the Corinthian church even into our day, is that to a woman's fullest ability, she images the glory of God her God-given beauty and distinctiveness and a joyful spirit by having her hair long. And that is, I believe, what functions as her covering. Some disagree over this. Costi, as you know, some say, no, it's kind of a shawl or a, a, a sort of distinctive covering, a scarf or something like that, that a woman wears in her hair. I would say, honestly, from this tough passage, that's a possible interpretation. I wouldn't want to say a woman who's doing that is in sin or something like that. But I do think we've got to be careful about making head coverings, whatever your view, the test of biblical womanhood. That's not what Paul does. That is what some of our peers are doing, and they're causing some confusion along those lines. And I have real concerns about that, as I think you do. I, I would have real concerns about that, too, Owen, um, if, if some of our peers... We're making head coverings the test of biblical womanhood, the test. Um, that would be concerning. Again, I, know, I don't know anybody who's doing that. Um, I don't. I'd love to know. I'd love to, because if somebody's doing that, I'd like to reach out to them. I'd like to address that. If somebody's making head coverings the test of biblical womanhood, um, a, a woman being faithful to the Lord, then, uh, then that needs to be addressed because there's a lot. There is a lot. Um, that would be a test of a woman's fidelity to Christ, a lot beyond merely her covering her head on the Lord's day. Um, but again, I, th these are these are some of the things that that I just um, I think this is the disconnect. I don't think it's what's being taught. I think it's just who's teaching it. You're not allowed to teach that. You might be right. You know, we even said that. You know. 
uh, it's a plausible interpretation. I think it's a little bit more than plausible, but it's a plausible interpretation. I see how you could get there. You might be right, but it's the, um, it's the, the divisive, uh, dangerous, extreme, the, the test of biblical womanhood, whether or not she covers her head. And, um, and I, I just, I don't see it. I don't see anybody doing that. I don't. Um, so, uh, I'm a local pastor, first and foremost, before uh, a guy who has a podcast and those kinds of things. I'm a local pastor, first and foremost. And you can ask every single member of my church if you would like. I have not taught on head coverings or mentioned it. Not just taught, like opened up 1 Corinthians 11 and done an expositional you know, sermon for 60 minutes. Um, I certainly haven't done that. I have not even mentioned head coverings. And the church that um, I planted in April of 2021 here in Central Texas... I have not mentioned head coverings once. It's been over two years. I have not mentioned it once. Um, we have lots of women who do not cover their head. Now, there are women who do cover their head. My wife covers her head. My sister covers her head. Uh, so there are women in the church who wear a head covering. And there are plenty of women who don't. Um, until really recently, I've noticed more women are covering their heads now. Uh, but until very recently, uh, I would say it was maybe only a quarter, at most 25% of the women in the church who were covering their heads. Um, now it looks as though it's maybe 40%, almost half and half, almost 50%. Uh, but again, I have not mentioned head coverings uh, in the corporate uh, assembly a single time. And even with my podcast, I have mentioned head coverings less than half a dozen times over the last two years. Probably, I, I believe, maybe three. This is probably the fourth or fifth time uh, that I'm, I'm actually taking some time to address uh, this particular topic. Um, so the idea that it's being made the test of biblical womanhood. Uh, in fact, I would agree with you know, my friend Michael Foster, that, uh, who is not a head covering guy, by the way. He disagrees with me on this. Um, but I would agree with him that um, not only is it not the test of biblical womanhood, it matters. I believe it's a command in scripture. It matters. But not, it is not the premier test of biblical womanhood. And not only is it not, um, it can be really deceiving. First Peter 3 says that um, it's not the outward beauty, right? It's not the outward appearance uh, of a woman. Um, but it's the inward beauty of the heart uh, that God finds precious in his sight, a gentle and quiet spirit. And the irony is that, um, that I have been aware of women who come into the position, the, the theological conviction, they and their husband, uh, that they should cover their head on the Lord's Day in worship. And so they begin covering their head. Um, but that particular woman is still what I would describe as a loud woman, not quiet and gentle in her spirit, uh, but loud and contentious. Um, there are women who cover their heads, um, but are uh, marked, marked, regularly marked by being argumentative with their husbands in their home. So they're wearing a sign of submission, but they don't have a submit, submissive heart. Now, part of that is because sanctification, internal sanctification, the heart actually being shaped more and more into the image of Christ, well, guess what? That takes time. It's a lifelong process from the point of conversion to the day we breathe our last breath. And in this life, we never fully arrive, right? This Wesleyan idea of sinless perfection, it's not a thing. It's, it's certainly not a biblical thing. And so um, none of us are going to be fully sanctified, perfectly sanctified in this life. We will not reach a state of sinless perfection. This is a long and arduous process of mortifying the flesh, putting sin to death, making no provisions for the flesh, as Owen would say, um, um, Owen, uh, John Owen, that is. Uh, I'm sure Owen Strand would say it too. I, I know he's a big fan of John Owen and, and so am I. So all that being said, uh, the point is that sanctification of the heart, becoming a woman who is marked by a quiet and gentle spirit inwardly, the beauty of the heart, that takes years. Coming in the conviction that you should wear a piece of cloth on your head on Sunday morning for an hour and a half, um, that, that, that is something that, that goes black, black to white, right? Night and day change um, over the course of a week, right? One Sunday, you're, you're there, and then the next Sunday, you're there and your head's covered. Um, you, so you can do that in the matter of from one Sunday to the next. 
you can make that transition, the external transition. And it does matter. If it's a command in Scripture, it matters. But it is not the mark of biblical womanhood. Um, the mark of biblical womanhood, as I see it in the Scripture, is the inward beauty of the heart. It's the inward, internal, lifelong process of sanctification, not just wearing a outward external symbol of submission, but actually possessing a heart posture of quietness and gentleness and submission to those that God has appointed in authority. And so, yeah, um, I, again, I, I just I don't know anybody who's making this the test of biblical womanhood. Um, but what I do know is that there are, again, individuals who are saying, I think that this is an issue that has been lost. Um, you, you look even the early 1900s, less than 100 years ago, and women at church, they're, they're wearing a covering. Now, most of them are wearing hats and not necessarily a shawl. Some of them are wearing shawls. Um, but it, it was, I mean, it was just, it was the normal position. It was the norm within evangelicalism in our country um, in, in just 70, 70 years ago that women are wearing hats. It wasn't until very recently that, that women started, I mean, some of them actually had orchestrated demonstrations where in the middle of the sermon on a Sunday, all the women, they had planned it ahead of time, they would took off their hats and threw them down. And it was a sign, it was a part of the feminist movement. It was a part of early kind of like second wave uh, feminism, this rejection of we're not going to wear a hat anymore and cover our head. And, and eventually evangelicals bought it. Now, if, if it is a command in scripture, not the mark of biblical womanhood, but a mark, a mark, one act of external obedience that the apostle took the time to write half a chapter of the Bible about, if it is a mark and you're living currently in a culture that is saturated in feminism, it's the air we breathe. All of us are more feministic than we even know, including myself. And that's, you know, the sons of Issachar, they knew the times. If, if we know that right now, um, extreme abuse of biblical patriarchy, there are maybe some examples of somebody with 17 followers on Twitter. There are examples of that, but we know that that is true, but it's the footnote. And the headline right now is feminism in our culture and in our churches. And, and in that, the vast majority of evangelicalism, I'm talking 90% plus, hasn't even entertained the idea of wearing a head covering for about 50, 60, 70 years, then yeah, it might be worth talking about. And again, not as the quintessential mark of biblical womanhood, but saying, hey, this is a forgotten commandment in the book of the law, in God's law word. And we should talk about it. Now, another thing that I want to say, um, what I appreciate about guys who, who are in our camp, we're, we're you know, not necessarily all on the patriarchal side of things. We don't necessarily agree on head coverings, but we're in the same camp in terms of being reformed, in terms of being conservative, in terms of being evangelical, um, and at least in terms of views of men and women, at least complementary. Um, what I appreciate is that most of these guys, if they don't hold to a head covering position that I would hold to, uh, they at least acknowledge that it is a command and it's a timeless command. That it's not merely cultural. It's not just that there was something unique like temple prostitution going on in Corinth at that time, in this place, in this time. And so Paul says, you know, you really want to stand out women from the, the prostitutes who are doing this. You want to make sure that there's not, um, you know, that people don't um, wrongly, you know, uh, associate you with them. So you need to have a physical, in your physical appearance, do something to distinguish yourselves. Go ahead and, and, and wear something on your heads or grow your hair out long. Um, what I appreciate is that most of the people in our camp more broadly, they, they're not saying that. Uh, they're saying, no, it's, it's a timeless command. And it's a timeless command because the Apostle Paul doesn't point to momentary cultural uh, a, a foundation or bases for his argument, uh, for issuing the command. Instead, what he draws on is the very same thing that the Apostle Paul draws on in 1 Timothy chapter 2. He draws on the created order. He draws on man 
and woman, man being formed first, and then woman, God's design. He draws on creation before sin even entered the world. And because the created order is the basis for the command that's being issued in 1 Corinthians 11, you must believe that it's timeless because if you, if you, whatever hermeneutic you have to employ to say that this is merely cultural, for it was just for Corinth, and, and, and just in that time and that place, and it doesn't apply to us today whatsoever, um, that same hermeneutic, if consistently applied to First Timothy chapter 2, that's, that's where you get Beth Moore. That's where you get women preachers. Because it's the same argumentation. It's the same basis. The created order. So you, you got to at least be able to say, now this is a command. It's not just cultural. It's a timeless command because it's rooted in the created ordinance. It's for all people, not just Corinth 2,000 years ago, but all people in all places. And I like that, that most of the guys, again, in our broader camp, they, they all agree with that. And I appreciate that. So then the question becomes, not is it a command? That argument's already been dealt with. Yes, it's a command for all people in all places. So now the question is, okay, but practically, how do we obey the command? Do we obey the command by um, wedding rings? That's kind of MacArthur's view. Uh, just a symbol of submission. It doesn't have to be on the head. You know, in, in our modern culture, you know, the wedding ring is enough to suffice for uh, married women that they're in submission to their husband. Um, or do we obey the command uh, by saying the hair is given to her as a covering, which is what the Apostle Paul says. Um, and so then we're saying, okay, well, just long hair. As long as, as a woman has long hair, then we're okay. Or are we saying that in addition to long hair, that long hair is given to her as a covering, and that's a sign that even nature itself teaches that a woman, the natural covering of long hair, is meant by God through nature to signify that she needs to be further covered on the Lord's day. And that she has to, she needs, in addition to long hair, to have an artificial covering, a hat or a shawl or some kind of uh, covering. In, in all three of those cases, the hair, the artificial covering, the wedding band, whatever it is, in all three of those cases, what I appreciate is at least all three of those camps are acknowledging this is not something that's just cultural. It's not something that's just particular to Corinth at that time. Because it's rooted in the created order. It's timeless. So I, I'm very grateful for that. Uh, the last thing that, I, that I'll leave you with is this. I appreciate the late, great R.C. Sproul. His wife, Vesta, who's still with us, God bless her, may, may she live forever, uh, she wears a head covering. Um, and that was Sproul's position, uh, that, that the long hair was not sufficient, but rather it indicated, which seems to be exactly what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 11, that the long hair is given to her as a covering, but it indicates that she should be further covered on the Lord's day. And so Sproul, um, he had his wife, Vesta, and I'm sure she agreed, wear a, a shawl or some kind of covering, artificial covering, in addition to her hair um, for Lord's Day worship. And as far as I know, she's still doing that. And one of the simplest things that Sproul said, he wasn't teaching, he wasn't a head covering guy, you know, teaching on head coverings every other week, and neither am I. I, I I'm not. Again, as I've already said, uh, over half of the women in my church do not cover their heads, and I have not mentioned it a single time from the pulpit, not once. Um, but Sproul, what he would say, and it's a similar argument that I would make, is this. He said, you know, I could be wrong. Maybe MacArthur's position's right. Maybe just the long hair, that, that's Doug Wilson's position, and that suffices. Maybe that's right. Um, <laughs> but I like the way Sproul worded it. He said, but this is what I know. He said, I know there's no command in the Bible that says that a woman shall not, that she must not cover her head. I know there's no commandment in the Bible that says, woman, thou shall not cover your head. But there might be a command in the Bible that says that she should cover her head. And so the last part of the clip where Owen talked about, well, we're not going to say it's sin. Um, if Owen is saying, well, I wouldn't say it's sin for those who, who hold to this other interpretation that a woman actually should wear a head covering in addition to her hair. Well, the, I appreciate that. I appreciate you saying that you, you wouldn't call that sin. Uh, but to be fair, um, the reason you wouldn't call that sin, brother, is because you can't. You can't. Because you and I both know there's no commandment anywhere in the Bible that says that a woman cannot cover her head. That's not the question. The question isn't whether or not a woman is not allowed to cover her head. The question is whether or not a woman may be commanded to cover her head. And that's Sproul's 
argumentation. He says, I know there's no commandment. He said, I'm just playing it safe. I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. That's Paul's position. Maybe I'm wrong. But I know this, that if Vesta covers her head on the Lord's day, one day we'll stand before God and we'll be all right. Because nowhere in the Bible was she commanded that she couldn't do that. But in 1 Corinthians 11, she might be commanded that she should do that. So we'll take the safe position. Better to cover, knowing there's no forbidding of covering, and find out that you didn't need to cover. You did something extracurricular, but you didn't do something that was forbidden. Then to not cover and find out you were commanded to do it, and you just rebelled your entire life. Now, my point is this. If my position's right, then, then yes, it is a sin. And that's not trying to be harsh or overly dogmatic. Again, that's not saying that this one particular commandment and therefore those who disregard it, that one particular sin is the, the end-all, be-all, the quintessential mark of holiness. I'm not saying that. But I'm saying it is a mark. It is a commandment. And if I'm right about the particular visible application of obedience to that commandment, that it's not just the hair, but an additional covering on the Lord's day in worship, then to fail to do so is, I don't know what word we would use to describe that other than sin. It would be sin. Now, if Owen's right with his position that the long hair suffices, my wife is not sinning when she covers her head on the Lord's day. But if my position which is the lion's share of church history's position up until 15 minutes ago, if that's the correct position and Owen's wife is not covering her head, then she is in sin. That's R.C. Sproul's exact argumentation. He said, I'm just playing the odds here. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe, you know, but even if I'm just 50-50 on the issue, you might as well take this, the safe bet. There's no forbidding of covering, but there might be a commandment to cover. And so here's the deal. If it is just even logically, not just theologically, but logically, I would argue theologically, it is the better exegesis. But even if we disagree on that, just logically, and Sproul would be on my side here, it's the safer position. And in terms of historically, so the theological argument, logical argument, and now historical argument, it is the witness of church history, the lion's share. Then yeah, I, I think it's it's maybe worth doing a couple podcasts over. It's maybe worth preaching on, which again, I haven't done. But probably I'm going to do it eventually. It, it, and I think that's okay. That doesn't, my, my whole point is, why, why is that weird? Why is that extreme? Uh, but... Uh, and I think that's just, that's my only real objection to this episode with Costi Hinn and Owen Strand. It's not even, it's not even their positions, right? So me and Owen disagree on, on the, the application of what it is to obey the 1 Corinthians 11 head covering command. Well, fine, me and Doug Wilson disagree. Doug Wilson has Owen's exact position. But we both agree that it's timeless. It pulls on the created order. It's not just cultural, and you got to do something with it. And, and, and Doug and Owen are doing one thing, and I'm doing another. And that's, that's fine, right? I, Doug Wilson disagrees with me on that point. But, I, but, but there's never been the difference. <laughs> the difference is um, that I've never been made to feel by Doug Wilson that because I think the hair is not sufficient as a covering. Paul's actually referring to an artificial covering in addition to the hair. I've never had Doug Wilson or somebody, you know, in that camp uh, make me feel like, like I'm out of line by taking the position that I do, that I'm, uh, that I'm, I'm, I'm walking on thin ice, that I'm treading in dangerous, dangerous, extreme patriarchal territory. I think that that would be my beef. That's my only beef. So we differ on head coverings. Sounds like, you know, from the first clip I played, we, we agree entirely on in terms of women teaching women. So I, I brought up two issues from that podcast. Those are the main two that they, they addressed. Um, I disagree with Owen on, on what it looks like for a woman to cover her head. But we even there, we both agree that it's a timeless command pulled on the created order. 
and um and then on in terms of what does it look like for women to teach other women uh, theology, we hold the exact same position. He just calls it hard complementarianism, and I call it biblical patriarchy. The difference between us in substance is minor, I guess is my point. I think it's minor. Um, but I, again, I'm just noticing from some of these guys, and I don't want to just pick on Owen. But I'm noticing from some of these guys, it's not that there's this major difference in theological substance. It's just that, that their crew, for lack of a better term, seems really concerned about my crew. It's not so much that we're theologically just night and day, massive difference between us. It's just, they just, I don't know, we give them the heebie-jeebies, we scare them. They don't like it. They're, they're, they're concerned, right? That's, that's the evangelical term. I'm concerned. I'm concerned. So, anyways, those are my thoughts. And I hope that the, we could bridge the gap. I hope that we could bridge the gap. Um, because I don't want... Uh, if I'm wrong, I, I want to see it. And I want to repent. And I want to I hold the faithful position. And if I'm not wrong... And there's just some slight theological differences in our positions that matter, but in the big scope of things are slight, then I'd like to be able to link arms and act like we're like if, if we're only an inch apart, I'd like us to be able to minister as though we're only an inch apart. I think my my big question is why why does it seem like we're theologically an inch apart, but relationally a mile? apart. And I can't quite figure that out. I have my thoughts. I have my thoughts. I think it's some of the company that I keep. I think that's a big part of it. I think it's probably also uh, that I never went to seminary. And for the record, I'm not trying to throw anybody under the bus here. Um, I've never been to seminary and I've never said that I have been to seminary. I've always been very clear about that. In anything I've ever written, in anything that I've ever said, any podcast, any sermon, any bio, any this, any that, um, I've never pretended to have more formal education than I have. Um, I've studied hard, but I, um, I have a bachelor's degree in business and biblical studies from Dallas Baptist University, and I transferred into Dallas Baptist University <laughs> um, from Christ for the Nations, which is a heretical word of faith, kind of like wizardry and witchcraft, Bethel type school, two-year school, and Dallas Baptist University is just gracious enough to take the credits, and I wanted to get a bachelor's because I wanted to do some things, you know, outside of ministry in the business world, and blah, 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 blah. And so, anyways, that's my formal education, and, uh, and I learned very, very, very little and some of the things that I learned I needed uh, to repent of and unlearn because they were heretical and wrong. And then I've just submitted myself to the scripture and solid teachers with, you know, I mean, John MacArthur and Ligonier and uh, Doug Wilson and all these, and just reading and reading and reading dead guys, which is really helpful, the Puritans and the Reformers and all these different Calvin's Institutes and just learning and learning and learning and applying myself and knowing that I still have so much more to learn, so much more to learn. Um, but using what I do have by the grace of God, um, to try to minister to others faithfully. And so all that being said, I, I don't know what the disconnect is. I, I hope that that's my, my prayer is that the disconnect, that it would get fixed, that it would get sorted out. Um, I, I want, I want to be on the same team. I really do. I really do. I want to be brothers. I want to link arms. I want to be able to, uh, to minister together. Um, be able to agree to disagree on some of these things, uh, but recognize that we, uh, what we agree on far outweighs what we disagree on and, uh, be able to minister together and, and whatever it is, uh, seriously, Owen, I mean this, whatever it is that I'm doing, maybe, maybe I really am doing something wrong and I'm just missing it. If that's the case, reach out to me, shoot me an email. Let's do a phone call. I'd, I'd love to talk and just figure out, is it, did I just word something terribly? in a podcast that I'm forgetting about, you know, or, um, 
or is it just the company? Is it, is, is it the fact that I like Doug Wilson? Is that all it is? I just, I like Doug Wilson and you don't, you know, is it, is it, is it <laughs> the boogeyman of federal vision? You're afraid federal vision is under my bed. Cause I, I completely denounce federal vision. I am a 1689 federalist. I, I am a reformed Baptist. I, I believe in regenerate church membership. I, you know, I, I don't, I don't know how even just logically I, I could hold federal vision. I don't know. So I don't know, man, um, if you know what it is, help me out, help me out. All right. Thank you guys so much for tuning in. I hope that this has been helpful for you. Last thing that I want to announce is our upcoming conference. This is March 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. It's called Blueprints for Christendom 2.0. The subtitle is Seven Doctrines for Ruling the World. We're going to be talking about Reformed Confessionalism, uh, Covenant Theology, Biblical Patriarchy, Presuppositionalism, Kyperianism, General Equity Theonomy, and Post-Millennialism. We're going to have some live panels going on uh, about um, Biblical Patriarchy. We're going to do a live panel on like all things um, Fortean kind of unhinged things with the Haunted Cosmos guys about uh, the Watchers and Nephilim and Giants and those kinds of things. It's going to be a great time. Um, our headlining speaker is Doug Wilson, so we're excited to have Voldemort. Uh, he who must not be named will be with us. And uh, I encourage you to go ahead and register. We are selling tickets fast and we are about to end our early bird pricing. That's going to end August 31st. So the end of next month, it's already July. Uh, so you've got less than two months and the price is going to go up. And it's not just the price hike, but again, it's the seating. Um, I, I think we sold out our last conference that James White was a part of, um, Theonomy and Post-Millennialism Conference. That was in May, just a couple months ago, and that sold out six months in advance. We sold out in December of last year, six months before that conference. And I really think that this conference, uh, Blueprints for Christendom 2.0, is going to sell out just as fast. So you, you don't want to miss the early bird pricing, but more than that, you don't want to miss a seat. And again, the tickets are selling fast. So go to Right Response Conference, not Right Response Ministries, but in this case, rightresponseconference.com. Again, that's rightresponseconference.com and register today. All right. Thank you guys for tuning in and join us tomorrow at 2 p.m. Central Time right here on YouTube or on Spotify or iTunes, or you can always go to rightresponseministries.com, our website. We also have a free app that you can download. Any of the multiple platforms that are all made available to you, go and check out tomorrow, 2 p.m. Central Time, our flagship show, Theology Applied. Nathan, who's our guest tomorrow? Oh, Eric Kahn. Eric Kahn. We're talking about why the church planting movement, not entirely, but significantly, largely, in many regards, has recently seemed to fail. It's a banger. We recorded ahead of time, and it's awesome. It, is, it was a really, for me just personally, my soul, it was a really, really good conversation. So tune into that 2 p.m. tomorrow, Theology Applied, me and Eric Kahn. We'll see you then. Until then, God bless.